Okay, we're going to call to order the uh, Thursday, May 14, 2020 meeting of the Clive City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Serxina? Here. Council members Klein? Here. Edwards? Here. McCoy? Here. Judkins? Here. And Weaver? Here. Well, very good. All present and accounted for. Again, thanks all for uh, for being with us. Um, so we have a full house. Uh, it's uh, it's our time to say the Pledge of Allegiance, and we have uh, Troop 208 member Henry Funk with us this evening. And uh, Henry, nice to have you with us. You're a junior at Valley, is that right? Yep. And that's a great thing. You just scored a bunch of points right there. <laughs> and um, uh, so welcome. And you're working on your Eagle Scout uh, project now, and congratulations on that. Uh, what a, that'll be a tremendous accomplishment for you, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to learning about that as you complete it and to celebrating that success with you. So, Henry, if you'd be so kind to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well done, young man. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and God bless your work on your Eagle Scout project. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, next item is approval of the agenda. I'm not aware of any changes. Move approval. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Eric. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Agenda is approved. Okay, this is a time now uh, on the agenda for citizens' presentations. This is where anyone that's joining us uh, for our meeting this evening can address the council on an item that is not currently on the agenda this evening. Uh, Pete, you, uh, uh, do you have anybody here to, uh, to do so? Mike, we'll give it a moment to see if folks raise their hand. You can also use the chat function to just to, uh, send me a note directly if you have anything that you'd like to bring forward to the council at this time. I do not see any hands up now. Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to consent items. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Eric. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, will the council please vote? That item passes five to zero, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move into action items now. The first item uh, is a resolution approving the first amendment to the agreement uh, for the collection of solid waste uh, between Metro Waste Authority and Ankeny Sanitation Incorporated. Matt, this is yours. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we have before you tonight uh, an item we've been discussing here for the last couple of months uh, related to the city's uh, potential transition to a new solid waste hauler starting July 1, 2020. Uh, the city is in its last year of its uh, initial term with uh, waste management for solid waste hauling. And so uh, a couple months ago, back in March, uh, the council approved a memorandum of understanding with Metro Waste Authority to serve as our representative in the negotiations for a new solid waste hauling relationship. Um, got Leslie Earl back here from Metro, uh, the deputy director of the Metro Waste Authority. Uh, as well to talk a little bit about the details, but just at a high level that I wanted to offer is uh, um, presenting, uh, Metro Waste is presenting a really good uh, agreement here in terms of the city of Clive moving on to an existing agreement that Metro Waste has with other uh, Metro Waste communities to have Ankeny Sanitation serve as our solid waste hauler, hauler at, at a rate of uh, to start off for this, uh, this one year. Um, at $8.34 per household, and that is uh, substantially less than our current rate uh, with uh, waste management. So this is a very cost-effective approach for the city. In addition, there will be new toters uh, 
located for each uh, residential property that will replace the waste management haulers because waste management owns those haulers as a part of those toters, excuse me, as a part of our existing contract. And that will, will be a transition that will take place before July 1. And uh, this is a transition that has happened before, but what will be nice about these new toters is they will be Metro Waste branded. So kind of just a standard brand, not associated with a specific hauler. So if the city were ever to change haulers again in the future, we would not need to do the toter change out uh, in the future. And then Metro Waste is serving kind of as the, um, the facilitator of the toter exchange and we will be reimbursing them. They are making the purchase of the toters on our behalf. Uh, and then they will be getting compensated over a period of time for those new toters. But uh, I know we included a lot of information in the packet related to the relationship uh, between the city Metro Waste and the new hauler, but uh, wanted to uh, introduce uh, Leslie to talk a little bit, any details that I may have missed, and then uh, both of us to answer any questions you may have on this action. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Mayor and Council, for your time this evening. I have enjoyed working with Matt and Joyce over the last several months, as, as Matt mentioned. I think they've done an excellent job raising um, good questions related to the relationship between uh, the city of Clive and Metro Waste Authority, as well as the hauler um, providing municipal solid waste uh, services going forward. I think they've asked great questions. They've represented the city really well. Um, I think that the uh, resolution before you tonight is um, one that will allow Clive to receive excellent service um, going forward. We've worked with Ankeny Sanitation for a number of years. Our experience with them is that they provide great service at the curb as well as customer service and overall good partners of ours, um, but also really appreciated their willingness to um, adopt City of Clive into our existing amendment and to honor the price that the um, cities that are currently covered under that contract um, get that rate as well as transferring that over to the City of Clive that's being adopted in. Um, there are three one-year extensions available on this contract, and so um, this would be the first of the one-year extension. And then in the somewhat near future, we would go out for an RFP um, to handle the, the solid waste services going forward. But other than that, I think Matt did an excellent job summarizing the services and the resolution that's before you. And so I would, I would echo if there's any questions that I could answer, I'd be happy to do so. Well, Leslie, thank you very much. And um, uh, council, uh, questions please for Leslie or Matt uh, at this point. Leslie, do you wanna comment on any possible impact on the days of service? We are working with Ankeny Sanitation and the expectation um, that we have shared with them and their willingness is to keep the collection days just as they are in the city of Clive right now. And so recycling and garbage days will continue to match up for your residents, um, whether they have Thursday collection or Friday collection, that will um, remain going forward. Thanks, John. I'd move the resolution. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Mayor. Well, just a second, Michael. So it's, yeah, been, I'm sorry. Uh, it's right. been moved by John and I believe seconded by Ted and further discussion, Michael. Sorry, uh, I'll be abstaining. Understood, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Mayor, this is Pete, Councilman Klein has a question. Eric, yeah, uh, yeah, Mayor, I, I did second that. A, a couple quick questions here. I see that there's a ability to have uh, some additional one year terms on, on the contract. What's the initial length of, of the initial contract, Leslie? The initial length of the contract was seven years, and so we're now in the first of the three one-year extensions that are available. The initial okay. term conclude, concluded um, June 30th of this year. Okay, second question was on uh, 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 customer service. Would that go through Ankeny Sanitation, or would that go through Metro? Um, most of that would be going through Metro Waste Authority. We have a full-time customer service representative in our agency um, with the second one to begin July 1st. Um, Ankeny Sanitation is our partner in providing that customer service, but Metro Waste Authority staff is certainly the frontline um, point of contact for the residents of Clive. 
um, which as Matt pointed out, is nice um, to have the Metro Waste Authority branded carts for that reason so that um, residents have quick access to our, our phone number as well as website. Okay, thank you. In your honor, if I could add in uh, just a, a few comments in terms of the transition that staff will be working on with Metro Waste in terms of communicating uh, the toter exchange, uh, how that, if the council would, would approve this tonight, uh, how we would communicate the toter exchange, also just the general communication of this transition. Um, as you know, this will require quite a bit of effort uh, to do, but uh, it'll be, as, as I mentioned earlier, it'll be an effort we won't necessarily have to do again in the future. So it'll be a lot of work to do over the next month and a half, but uh, I know Leslie's already started the communications with the, uh, the communities that are being added to this ASI contract and how we do that transition. And I'm confident we'll be able to do that in a, in a timely manner. Matt, I know it's not, it's not germane to this particular agreement, but I think it's an important topic, uh, certainly to our residents. And that, can you update us on um, Mayor's cleanup uh, days or potentially when, uh, et cetera, we can get that facilitated because we're getting asked all the time. Yeah, happy to uh, um, provide some thoughts on that. So uh, Leslie and I have been in discussion on this topic uh, here very recently as well. Um, as the council's aware, uh, waste management um, pulled back on any large item and, and community cleanups uh, here over the, the last few months related to the COVID-19 response and their ability to staff that. Uh, we are getting some indications that they are, are going to be ready to move into the large item pickup. And I don't want to, I don't want to speak too far out of turn here, Leslie. So jump, feel free to jump in, but that, um, that there could be on a path here to get back to large item pickup. And our hope is, is that the mayor's cleanup wouldn't be too far behind. And that our hope would be is to before the our existing contract with waste management is up at the end of June, that we're able to get a mayor's cleanup done before the end of that contract. If not, uh, we would work to receive some kind of enumeration from um, waste management uh, to make sure we have some kind of mayor's cleanup happening at some point this year, whether it's uh, through our current hauler or our uh, new hauler pending their approval of this agreement. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, again, this has been moved and seconded. We're just having a discussion at this point. Are there any other questions or discussion? Yeah, I, I, I had one, Mayor. Um, Matt, you mentioned the, the toad exchange and communication. Can you go into a little bit more specifics about how that's gonna be done, the logistics of that, and, and how we're gonna be communicating that to residents? Because that is kind of a big deal. I will, Leslie, if that's all right, defer to you as somebody who has done this before in terms of kind of how that process uh, typically goes. Sure. Um, the the cart rollout, we are working with the cart manufacturer as well as the distributor um, right now to finalize the schedule of um, when those carts, the new carts will be delivered as well as the old ones um, collected from the curb. And so we'll work with the city, um, you know, pending this vote tonight, um, we'll schedule a meeting with um, city staff to determine the best ways to reach residents. Um, the message of the, of the, you know, pertains a little bit differently to every community that is joining this contract. And so as we work closely with city staff to determine what message pertains specifically to your residents um, and the best ways that you all have found um, over the years to communicate with them, um, likely that would include uh, newsletter articles, social media, um, uh, Metro Waste Authority provided content and graphics and so um, we could look at some other um, options as well um, but would really lean on the city staff to uh, provide input for us as to what the best ways are to reach the residents and then um, Metro Waste Authority staff are prepared to um, draft the content um, and provide all of the necessary information to use those tools that you found over the time to, to deliver messages such as this. So Leslie, two questions. Um, one, uh, you know, we have different size bins. Some some have smaller, some have larger, and and some residents have multiple bins. Is, so is it going to be a one to one exchange? So whatever they have now, they would get an exact exchange. And then second question is, do we have any sense for for the timing of this? When when would this happen? 
Sure. Um, so a, f a few different options that we're, we're working towards and, and really we'll take the lead of what the, the staff and council's preference is. Um, we, we could work to do one-to-one um, -one, um, swaps or exchanges on collection days. So that is if a resident has a 48 gallon versus a 96 gallon, we would, we would take it at face value that what they had is likely what they want to have. Um, per the city's recommendation, we could also have another um, opportunity where residents could provide that information to us or if they want to exchange, um, you know, if they want to have a different cart size than what they currently have, there would be an opportunity to do that as well. Um, our goal is to minimize the length of time as, as long as possible. Um, minimize the length of time where residents have two carts. Um, we don't we don't want them to have to store that as, as long as they don't have to or um, be tempted <laughs> to use two carts when um, they really are going to only have the collection option for the one cart, assuming that that's what they have right now. And so a lot of different opportunities. Um, I know that the um, the cart manufacturer as well as the hauler want to provide excellent service as does Metro Waste Authority for the city and so we're open to um, the preferences of the city but but largely I would assume that it would take place um, for the cart swap and also dependent I know all cities have different records as far as um, which residents have 48 gallons versus 96 gallons and so um, whatever data the city might have available would definitely play into that rollout. Uh, means as well. And if I could add in to the Leslie's comments, we are looking at our records now to Council Member Weaver in terms of the hopefully be able to specify the, the sizings, um, those that have the smaller toters versus the larger toters and, and try to see if we can match things up as close as possible. Thank you. Good, other questions, Council, for Leslie, why we have her just a, a note of congratulations to Leslie and Metro Waste and city staff for this is a great result, I think. Agreed very much. Thank you, John. John, anything else is our representative to MWA uh, on this? No, I mean, it's, this is a terrific result uh, all around. Uh, the branded toters, the lower price, and uh, the service level. I think it's all going to be positive. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Council, if there's nothing else, uh, uh, this has been moved and seconded. Uh, would request a vote, please. And that item passes four in favor with one abstention. Thank you, and thank you, Leslie, and Matt and John for your efforts as well. Okay, we'll move on to action item number two, which is a site plan amendment for McDonald's at uh, uh, 11, uh, 11400 uh, Forest Avenue. And Jill, I think you have this one. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. All right, so McDonald's is looking for a facade update uh, to their location at 11400 Forest. Uh, so that's the corner of uh, 114th and University, the one just down the street from City Hall. Uh, they previously had a site plan amendment uh, that was just staff approved in January. So that included um, some items, mostly ADA requirements to the existing ramp parking lot, and then the connection from 114th Street to the building to make those more compliant. Um, with that, they're also doing an interior renovation. They're updating a little bit of landscaping um, and getting new menu boards. So you may see that uh, coming up. That's uh, been staff approved in January. At the time, they were not applying for any sort of facade changes, um, but that they came back with that recently. So that triggered the uh, plan commission and council review. So that's what you have in front of you today. And that's why it's only for the facade. Uh, so previously those those items were approved and what we're looking for here is a typical uh, McDonald's remodel like you've probably seen around the metro. They're going to remove that mansard roof and update that roof line for um, a more modern modern look. They're also squaring off the front of the building a little bit. 
So the front corners um, are cut off. So those are gonna be at 90 degrees now. They're gonna put new windows in the front. Uh, and our code currently prohibits the painting of existing brick. So what they're gonna do is have a, a nice mix of modern materials, but keeping the existing brick uh, in a neutral color scheme so everything matches and goes together. So there's a, a combination of exterior porcelain tiles. Those are those uh, tower columns that are features on the couple sides of the building. There's an aluminum trellis and some corrugated metal around the roof and around the drive-through windows as well. So staff is happy with the blend of uh, new, new and old materials to keep a, a little bit of the existing brick look, but update the building. And there was a couple items in the uh, comment letter, but those have been satisfied. So staff is recommending approval. Well, thank you, Jill. Uh, council, questions for Jill? Move approval. Just one moment, Councilman Klein has a question. Yeah, Jill, quick question. I, I, I'm always in favor of any kind of an updating and really like the look of it. Did have a question. There, I, I see that they're gonna be breaking up one of the windows in the drive-through. I had a concern that that, that that could cause a traffic backup. Any concerns with staff about that? No, we had no concerns with that. Um, maybe someone from, I'm not sure if someone from McDonald's is here to kind of speak on why that was um, bricked up. I'm not sure if anyone is on. Yeah, I, Christy from Reprise Design is here. They usually do that stuff o overnight so that they don't impede that drive through at all. The McDonald's really tries not to fold up anything in their drive through because that it doesn't benefit them. So they will do that mostly from the inside and what they need to do from the outside. All the outside work will be done in shifts overnight so that it doesn't stop the drive through. Yeah, no, I, I'm not talking about the construction. The reason they have two windows is to facilitate the transfer of goods in a timely fashion. When you reduce that in half, kind of from two to one, is there a concern that there won't, that the cars will not be able to go fast enough? My concern is that the cars be backed up. That's my concern. I know they, they still have the two drive through windows. The only thing that we're blocking in is the old window. There was an old window there and they had moved it further towards the rear of the store so that they could have more stacking between windows and it just has never been closed in. So all we're doing is closing in an old window that's not, that's actually closed in from the inside already. Okay, thanks, that makes sense, thank you. It's not functionable now, right? Christy? Right. What was that? Yeah, it's not functioning now. Correct, it's not yeah. functioning now. They have moved to a different window a long time ago. Very good. Okay, thank you. Move awesome. approval. Well, one moment, Mayor Councilman Weaver has a question. Well, I'll go ahead and second John's motion first. Okay, so it's moved and uh, moved by John, seconded by Ted. Discussion? Yeah, so I just have a basic question. This may be for Doug, but um, why, why do we not allow painting on existing brick? I, I mean, I'm just trying to understand the logic behind that. That seems odd to me. I don't know if Doug's on. I'm not sure if he's there. Um, I'll give a shot at that one. I think just historically, the, you know, once you paint over brick, you've lost its original aesthetic appeal. And, you know, you're never going to get that back. Uh, so I think it's just an effort to preserve original brick. Um, that's, in my opinion, kind of timeless. So it's not going to go away where if you choose a paint color, that's, you're you're done now and you have to paint that brick from here on out um, so I think it's just an effort to keep keep that high aesthetic and original uh, high quality materials yeah I guess I could make the argument that there's some original brick that's kind of ugly and I've seen lots of brick that's been painted that looks a lot better once it has been painted so I don't know true. I, was just, I was just curious true yes. <laughs> um, it's Amanda if you want I can chime in on that as well sure uh, so there's some long-term maintenance concerns. If you paint brick, uh, moisture and stuff doesn't wick away the way it's intended to. Um, so that can cause uh, like the mortar joints to fail and some other maintenance needs uh, that a lot of places aren't really equipped to handle long-term. So okay. it's better to, to leave it unpainted both for the aesthetic and the long-term maintenance and viability of the exterior product. 
Okay. Thanks, Amanda. Yep, no problem. Other questions, Council? I do not see any, Mayor. Okay, seeing none, will the Council please vote? Item passes five to zero. Uh, thank you, uh, Jill and Christy. All right, we'll move to item number three, which is uh, approval of the site plan at 8800 Hickman Road, the new public, public safety facility. Amanda. Okay, sorry, I had to get unmuted there. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so tonight, as the mayor said, we're uh, finally going to approve the site plan for the public safety facility. Um, you guys are familiar with this project overall. Uh, we've been talking about it for quite a while. We've gone through the bond process and some of those public components to it. Um, so I'll get started here with the, uh, Pete, can we screen share? Yes, one moment. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, you should be able to now, Amanda. Okay, perfect. Can you all see the site plan? Not yet. How about now? There we go. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so you can see here the, the general site layout. Um, the the building is going to be just under 45,000 square feet. The site is about four acres. Um, as I think you all know, this was the former Slumberland property. They vacated the site um, to move out further west past the Jordan Creek development. Um, so the city purchased this and demolished the building. I believe it was in January that the building came down. And so we're ready to um, start construction on the new public safety facility. Uh, so, are you getting everything situated over here on the computer? <laughs> um, the exterior of the building is a mix of um, multiple materials here. You have the... Uh, Aluminum panels and siding, translucent panels, um, brick veneer, and precast concrete. The precast concrete is allowed as an exterior material in our C2 zoning. It's not in some of our other commercial districts, but that is allowed um, in the district that this property falls into. You can also see that there are some overhead doors. We have the one here for the police garage entrance, and then you have three on the uh, west facade here, or west end of the facade here um, that are for the three entries for the apparatus bay. Um, this is the concrete paneling you see with another uh, door that would be um, the second entry exit for the uh, police garage, the south elevation, and then the west elevation. Um, staff had raised some concerns with the materials being utilized on the west side, since it is a very large expanse, it doesn't have a ton of variation. Um, so one thing that the design team did to address that concern was uh, this example picture here. You can see with that paneling, they're um, proposing some variety in the color that's used that'll help break that up. Additionally, um, as you can see on this page here, uh, this facade long term will be largely screened once the landscaping on that side is mature. The east facade has the same kind of treatment, um, but it is blocked basically by the stuff, et cetera, building. So we think long term, the kind of visual impact of that large expanse of wall will be downplayed by the, ex the landscaping that's proposed on site. Um, back to the sheet here. Um, so on the site layout, you can see that we have the building situated. This building is further north than the existing building or previous building that was on the site. So we are getting some more separation for these residential homes to the south. Um, you will have the large landscape buffer behind that we can talk about with the landscaping plan. Um, that exceeds the 50 foot buffer area. I believe it's approximately um, between 65 and 70 feet along that back line. And then uh, the site circulation, the entries are existing both off of Hickman Road. Um, this first one is shared with the church. There is another one over here that's shared with stuff, et cetera. We have an existing ingress, egress easement to utilize that one. 
um, as you come into the site, you would go this way to get to the church or this way to come into the public safety facility. Um, there's parking in the front, you can see, that'll largely be utilized by visitors and um, some of the administrative staff or other types of uses uh, in the building, like training or things of that nature. And then coming around the back side here, um, you can get into the police garage, that would be controlled access. Um, but as you come around here, there aren't any gates or anything or any security measures to stop the public from coming back here. Um, the thought right now is just signage will be used to indicate that this is largely intended to be staff parking in the rear. Um, the uh, area to the southwest is largely intended to be for training for the fire department. And then the area over here in the northwest is a fairly large expanse of concrete, um, but the way the trucks maneuver in for the uh, fire equipment is they'll come in and kind of make a U turn to back into the bays. In the future, this is set up, they could be pull through bays, but with the current operations, um, the fire department is going to continue backing in. So we have that area there to allow those trucks to make those, those movements as needed. Um, the parking on site, as I said, is divided between the two upper and lower areas, plus what is provided in the police garage here. And of course, the equipment and vehicles in the fire apparatus bay. Uh, the code doesn't have a specific parking requirement for public facilities like this. Uh, they're very unique in nature, and we have the benefit of knowing exactly what those long-term needs are as far as the total number of staff at build out for the community to adequately service um, for our fire station and police stations here. So about half of that parking is needed for um, actual employees on site on any given shift. And then the other half of the parking serves as that shift changeover. And then for those other uses I'd mentioned, um, such as the public coming in or training opportunities. Uh, the site lighting has been carefully considered to reduce as much impact on the residential properties as possible. A lower K value, which is how much blue light is in the light fixtures has been selected. Um, so that the blue light content, um, there's a lot of studies that indicate there are some environmental and human health concerns with having too much blue light. It can impact um, ability to sleep and vision at night and other sorts of things. Um, so we picked a lower K value light, so it'll be a little warmer. Um, additionally, the light fixtures are mounted for the pole lights at 24 feet. The maximum mounting height is 25, so they're a little lower than that. And the light fixtures um, around the back side of the building all have a neighbor friendly optic technology that helps block any light trespass onto the other um, residential properties in that area. Onto the landscape plan. Um, I mentioned that buffer before that is here at the back of the property. Um, you can see it's very densely landscaped. Um, that landscaping extends up the west side of the property, and then we have quite a bit in the front. So the amount of trees for the buffer is slightly reduced what's in the buffer because of these detention facilities that are placed there, and the grade change made it very challenging to get as many trees needed in that area. So a few of the buffer count trees have actually creeped up into this area here. So the total number of trees on site meets the requirement. So in order to make up for a few of those trees not technically being in that buffer space, um, some of those initial planting sizes have been increased. So you'll get a little bit more mature and established tree at the onset of the project um, that'll help provide benefit for those property owners to the south. Additionally, there are five trees on site that we're hoping to preserve through the construction. If for some reason those end up not surviving, they will be replaced at the end of the construction. Um, there's also a, a couple trees on the church property that will have to be removed and replaced and a few that are um, hoping to be saved but may end up perishing with the grade changes potentially but would of course be replaced if they do. On to the uh, stormwater features. I mentioned the detention that's in the back. We also have the detention basins in the front and you can't really see it on this plan sheet but back on the layout. Um, if we zoom in, you can see that these um, main front spaces are proposed to be the permeable pavers. So that'll also help with the um, stormwater. Uh, additionally, there is underground pipe detention here, 
on the west edge that will help store the volume of water and there are modified soils throughout to help um, as well with that. Uh, here's an example of the grass plantings that we're wanting to utilize for those detention basins in the front. Um, we're trying to pick some natives and things like that that will be lower maintenance, um, but also still aesthetically pleasing to kind of keep a manicured look there as well. Um, a couple items were brought up by the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. One was to explore opportunities for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, I believe now one is intended to be incorporated from some follow-up conversation that took place after that meeting. Um, the other comment from Planning and Zoning Commission was to um, look at if there's any need for signalization here um, on this kind of northwest corner where the uh, intersection with the church property is. So as the fire vehicles are leaving, it would um, alert or a stop sign or flashing light, something of that nature. So the, the design team has looked at that and currently are not recommending anything additional. Um, the church is really only utilized on um, one day or so of the week. They have a fairly small congregation and we're not anticipating any conflicts there. Um, so at this time, that's not something we're recommending to move forward with, but the design team did look at that following last week's meeting. Uh, the pedestrian infrastructure for the site, you can see here, we're completing what is currently a gap in our sidewalk system along Hickman. So that will get um, connected. And then this pedestrian ramp here, um, as it exists today, you can see the ramps don't align, so that will be corrected with this construction process as well. And then we have the sidewalk coming into the site additionally that'll provide that pedestrian connection to Hickman Road. Um, with that, I don't know that I have anything else. I'll kind of hand it over to Matt to give you um, a little bit more information. And I think he had um, maybe some renderings or something to share with you guys, so. Matt, before you take over, Councilman Weaver has a question. Councilman? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Amanda, are we storing the police vehicles outside under a carport, or do we have an interior garage, or how are we doing that? This? Um, it is actually interior. I guess I can pull up the rendering here, try to find the sheet with it. You can see here, um, is the garage door on that east facade. So those, those vehicles and equipment will be stored inside. Um, I believe there is one vehicle for each department that's intended to be parked outside. Um, I think that's just like the chief's vehicle to get around with. Um, okay. But so because the, of the uh, sensitive equipment and things like that in the vehicles, it's really best if we can keep them inside to kind of control some of the temperature changes and other right. things well, that your cars will be exposed to. Officers are coming on duty and they're they're checking their equipment and the the uh, their signals and their their uh, sirens and all of that. That's all being done inside and not outside. Then, right? Um, I'll have to let Matt or one of the chiefs speak to exactly the procedure on checking the equipment. Yeah. Um, but there is room for those vehicles inside. Yes. Yeah, happy to happy to chime in on that. So yes, uh, Councilmember Weaver, that is the intent. So for putting the patrol vehicles uh, indoors to allow for the protection of those vehicles, but also to insulate the noise from um, checks of lights and sirens to keep that interior into the facility and not have that be an impact uh, to the adjacent neighborhood. Is right, that was a concern. Okay, thank you. Councilman Klein has a question. Uh, you answered it. I, I had the same question on impact of shift change siren test, but uh, you guys already answered it. Thank you. And so before I uh, uh, jump in with some further detail and, and, and have the chiefs, because uh, I know the majority of the council hasn't seen uh, a lot of these details yet, and so we want to make sure we take some time to walk through this tonight. Before we do that, though, why we kind of have Amanda and she has her screen up, is there anything kind of specific to the site plan that either Amanda or I can answer before we kind of move into uh, even further detail on the interior of the facility as well as the exterior. Man, I have a question that's a little bit, I don't know, some it has to do with this. Amanda covered a little bit of it on the sidewalk coming up from the east to the property. 
you go further to the west and right we're, we're minus the sidewalk obviously at that point is there any option ever to get a sidewalk to the west under the railroad and all that or is that just not even possible um i wouldn't necessarily think it's impossible um it's certainly always a challenge when you're working with the the railroads on getting any crossings there um, there are other sidewalk crossings with railroads though, so I'm sure it, it's doable. I don't know the technical limitations with grades and things of that nature for making that full connection there though. That's well, something we'd point, have to look into. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cause when you drive up there, it's strange, right? You see the Urbandale side and there is a sidewalk. So it, mm -hmm. at, at the least, could we look at, at the crossing in front of the new station uh, at the stoplight crossing, can we do a pedestrian crossing over to the Urbandale sidewalk? You know, we, to get people across. Uh, like we did look at that. One. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, we did look at that. Um, as you can see here on the aerial, if you guys can still see my screen, um, yeah. there actually isn't sidewalk in this area at this time. Okay. Um, and we know they did do some work uh, on this frontage road uh, within the last year. So we did drive by and actually check on site. Those sidewalk connections have not been um, put in on the Urbandale side. So right now, if we added that, it would be a crossing to nowhere. Um, so that but is something we can certainly like add in the future. Half a block down over there to the west. Yeah, it, it picks up all the way over here. Um, but over there and up top of the access road, right? That's all sidewalk. Oh, sure. Park. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, there is some up here, but you'd have this this gap here that wouldn't make it accessible. Be nice to work with Urbandale in the future as connectivity and bicycles and walking and all that, but that's for another day. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that almost have to be an overhead bridge to, to get connectivity? Um, I think you'd be able to do um, a similar crosswalk as you have up here. Um, if it, How pedestrian friendly it would feel is another question. That's always a challenge whenever you're taking um, what is a highway and trying to make a connection across it uh, where it is particularly wide, of course, and there's not really a great um, median refuge there. So it, it's certainly something that could be looked at as a future improvement along Hickman. But you're right, it would be challenging and not the most inviting environment for pedestrians. Matt, do you want to get into uh, into your yeah. photos and, and uh, renditions? Yeah, happy to do that. I'm going to, uh, we'll probably switch screens here if that's all right, Pete. When you're ready, just let me know. I'll, I'll just start off with a few comments, uh, and Amanda ha uh, covered a number of them. But <clears throat> one thing um, I wanted to mention is, as we from the very beginning of when we started the uh, this project, neighborhood engagement was was very important to us, and I know to the all of the council. And so we've had a series of neighborhood meetings over the past uh, year, actually three to be exact, uh, two in person and one virtual, not that long ago. Um, to walk through the details of this plan. And I wanna uh, definitely call out all the work that, that our facility committee has done, uh, Mayor Circina, Council Member Edwards and McCoy, in terms of kind of shepherding this site plan to what you're seeing here today. Uh, a lot of effort has been put into that. And so uh, with that in mind, we engaged the neighborhood uh, from the very beginning. And I think uh, hopefully with what some of the things that uh, Amanda outlined really showed, the extra effort that we are taking in terms of being recognizing, uh, trying to limit any impact to the neighborhood to the south. Um, we haven't, uh, we've had a limited interaction with the neighborhood, not a ton attending some of those conversations. We have had some direct adjacent. Um, uh, Angie Fonk, who our owner's rep, has also called each of the six residential properties to the south directly to inform them about the project. And then the, the so far the response that we've received from those six particular property owners is, is support and excitement for the project and no concerns at this point, which is which we're very excited about. Um, but so as you saw with the buffer of do, us doing more than 50 feet in terms of that landscape buffer to the south to really maximize that as much as we could to really increase the landscaping in that area 
that's all, you know, that's been an important part. I know something that the facility committee has wanted to see and then being mindful of the lighting and the noise and how we're trying to do things, having front end parking that points to the north with the staff parking for the police officers and firefighters in the back where, and then they have shift change, being mindful of that. Um, a lot of things have gone into um, the thought process here. And, and so just wanted to mention that, that we've been trying to, to be very engaged with the neighborhood on, on the discussion of this new facility. What I wanted to show here is, uh, these are a couple actually updated renderings, even from what was included in your packet in terms of the coloring, uh, to give a sense of uh, the aluminum panels that are kind of made to look like wood panels, almost like a cedar look, uh, kind of a, almost more of a red look to it to really pop off of the, um, the brick overlay and the translucent panels. And also, I know uh, one uh, discussion item quite a bit with the uh, facility committee has been, you know, what's this precast panel um, going to look like? And I, I know Amanda showed one of the kind of real life pictures, but we wanted to, uh, I know SBPA has updated this, the design team earlier this week, to really show some variation that we want to show in those, um, those precast panels. Uh, knowing that we've got two big boxes on the ends with the apparatus bay and the, and the interior garage for the police vehicles that we've got to really work hard to, to make that big concrete box look a lot more, um, have a little bit more variety than, than, than typical. So that's definitely something that we're very cognizant of. Also wanted to note uh, the patio area uh, with the sunshade with it as well for the fire department folks. This is just as we'll talk about in the interior part of the project or interior uh, view of the building. Uh, this is just adjacent to the day room kitchen area. Uh, part of the building. Again, this is a little more definition to the precast on the, on the police vehicle side, police garage side. And then a view from the back, um, back of the facility. We tried to limit, you'll notice that the apparatus bay, the front doors on the north side of the building, um, more glass to see into the, to the building. Being cognizant of the neighbors to the south, we wanted to have less glass on the southern uh, doors to really limit, um, even at night when the apparatus bay is led to limit any kind of spillage of light as, as much as we can um, from the back side of the facility. And then you'll notice when we get into the interior is this uh, zone right here is it's kind of the residential portion of the facility for the firefighters uh, in terms of their sleeping quarters. So we wanted to kind of keep the residential aspect of the facility um, on the residential side um, of the site. A little more definition to that front entrance way. Uh, one thing that we've been talking about, and I know the facility committee brought this up um, in terms of how we're incorporating public art uh, into this facility. One thing that we're talking about at the design team level, and I've even had some conversations with Richard and, and engaging the public arts commission in this, is we've got this pretty expansive space in the facility, um, this clear story in the lobby area. Uh, we're kind of thinking of uh, a project that we could do or uh, a piece of public art that we could commission that could actually even maybe even be suspended from the ceiling. And so it'd be visible at night through the glass from even Hickman Road. And we haven't really done an interior piece uh, like that of that kind of scale for our public art collection. And so that's something that um, we're talking about of figuring out a way for this important facility to have a flavor of public art, which I know is, in, is important to the council to see. And another view of that um, front entrance way, um, and then a clear story above. Any, uh, before I move on to the uh, interior of the building, any questions on kind of what you're seeing from an architectural standpoint with the facility? We're, we're, we've been working on this and making tweaks here and there, but uh, pretty happy with where we're at this point, but would love to have any feedback or questions from council on that at this point. Looks good. All right. Moving on, I um, want to bring the chiefs into the conversation here to kind of talk a little bit about, this is a, a little bit more of a cleaned up internal view of the facility. I know in the site plan documents, they get pretty busy and have a lot of lines on them and pointing to a lot of things. So I asked the design team to kind of give me a, a few peels of the layer back to really kind of keep it pretty simple. but. Uh, wanted to give the chiefs an opportunity to kind of walk through a little bit um, the facility, see what questions the council may have just in terms of where we've, uh, all the iterations that we've done in terms of the internal 
programming of the facility. So I think uh, Chief Rowe is on the line. I'll have a uh, Chief, we'll start on the fire side and then work our way to the police side. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, just kind of start, um, as you come in the, the shared lobby and what is uh, left of the shared lobby on your screen is the uh, office space. And to the left of that is uh, the, the kitchen, dining, and day room. Uh, it's uh, built with an, an open concept and it has access directly in um, to the left of the kitchen. Uh, it's not labeled, but that is the patio. And just below that is a reports room which is kind of a, a main hub for what we do where people have access uh, with a shift. Folks have access to computers for writing reports and working on special projects. And move, um, uh, which way you want to move, Matt? Let's just move down into like the... Um, uh, you may want to mention, Chief, too, that the report writing room is actually going to have windows to be able to view into the apparatus bay. We'll have uh, we'll have sight into the apparatus bays as well as to the uh, the apron approach uh, to the building. Maybe and, go to the apparatus bay. Um, on the screen, kind of breaking up. Uh, she's losing you. Off of the bay. Our EMS supplies, our, our, our drugs, and things that we use to restock and get ready for the is um, um, below that is hose storage, which is storage for some. And below that um, is really kind of a, an interesting element in the building uh, we try to separate the, the dirty areas from the the clean living areas uh with with some transitional space um there's a, a vestibule two vestibules that do that as well as um the the space there with the two showers and the laundry one of the things we wanted to be able to do is if if folks come back from a um a fire call and they're very dirty uh, we want them to have the ability to get in there and be able to shower before they uh, carry any of that carcinogens or smells or dirt, those types of things into the uh, into the living areas. Um, that that is also the the laundry area for their uniforms, so they'd be able to to get things laundered um, uh, before they would go into the living spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, to the right of uh, those are the hallway, you've got an electric room, IT server, and IT workroom. Um, electrical room is pretty self-explanatory. Um, IT server uh, is built, um, I believe, uh, the entire city uh, network servers and stuff will be, will be housed out of uh, uh, this building once it's up and running. Chief, this is Pete. Uh, Councilman Klein has a question. Councilman? Councilman Klein, do you have a question? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, I did have a question, uh, Chief, on the EMS room. You know, there's protocol and security on uh, with the narcotics and drugs. What is your plan uh, for securing that particular? Uh, uh, those products. Uh, that was you cut out. A yeah, sorry, Chief. Securing our drugs and narcotics. Uh, right, I know we do a vending machine uh, 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 system right now. Um, blocks that you see in that room. Chief, I think your I think your audio is a little chopped up. We're kind of losing you in and out. I'll I'll. I'll answer for them quick just because I know what the answer is. Um, so the, the vending machine has a security secure system on it um, where it actually requires a certain uh, access and actually takes photos of uh, when anybody's ever taking anything out um, of the 
uh, vending machine itself. So we already have kind of the built-in security. Uh, but one thing we are doing and looking at is adding a camera um, in that space as well. That's additionally tied into the building security system um, as kind of a redundancy to uh, the security that we already have on the vending machine. Matt, would we be transferring the current vending machines then in addition to adding that additional uh, camera system then? Is, is that the plan or would they be new vending machines? Uh, I think uh, I believe our intent at this point is to use the existing vending machine that we have and transfer that to the new facility. Thank you. That is correct. Why don't you give it another shot, Chief? Okay. Um, so we were uh, um, talking electric uh, um, IT server room. Um, right now we've got centered the apparatus bays. Um, to the left of the apparatus bays um, at the top, we've got um, an SCBA workroom as well as a shop. We're trying to separate so when we're working on SCBA or things that need to be done in more of a sterile environment, we're not doing it on the same workbench that we've recently torn apart a, uh, a, a dirty chainsaw. So the SCBA uh, compressor room at the top, uh, top area, uh, stairs that then go to an upper mezzanine that I'll describe in a, in a minute. Common room is where we uh, clean um, the, the really dirty things from ambulance calls to firefighter gear to uh, just kind of any of the multitude of things that we run into. Off the decon room is the gear locker uh, where we store our, our firefighter gear. Um, that room will also serve as a tornado shelter uh, for the entire building. Uh, built to 250 miles an hour, and we did a little research. I think that is, is built to an F5 standard. Um, as a, a restroom built off there. And of course, access to the apparatus bays and the decon room. The outdoor storage is where we can store things that, um, whether it's a, a snow blower or, or mower or just things that we use um, outdoors. Uh, any questions on that uh, west side of the apparatus bay before we move into more than areas? Okay. Uh, Matt, let's go to the, the sleeping bunk rooms if we could. Okay. Um, you'll see the lieutenant suite. Um, the office that the lieutenants uh, use is right off of their, their sleeping area. That way they've got a, a telephone in case the uh, station gets a phone call or, or something at night. And then we've got uh, individual bunk rooms around the outside. Um, across the hall corridor are uh, bathroom shower rooms. And... Uh, then we have our individual uh, personal lockers. Um, from the lockers, you have access into the uh, fitness tactical room. And the fitness tactical room has a, a door. Some people enjoy working outside when the, uh, uh, when the weather's nice. So they get the opportunity, they can take some equipment out and work out outside when it's nice. Um, up in the, uh, we get into the training room, uh, kind of two, I'll talk about the classroom, uh, 165, uh, kind of a smaller classroom, uh, for the, the fire department. Uh, we do, we have some procedures where we actually use paralytics to do, um, uh, for airway control. And sometimes those are, the labs that we set up uh, where folks practice this, sometimes those are set up for, for two and three weeks at a time. And in the current environment where we do that in just the big room that we have, Chris, you know, taking it down, taking it down, types of things. The larger training room um, is um, uh, obviously built and geared for um, uh, different police and, and fire training, um, has a kitchenette off of it in case 
uh, anything where there's uh, meals or snacks that will be um, served with that. And the only, um, the other thing that I want to uh, point out uh, before I answer questions or pass the baton to Chief Vainema is on the far west side of the building above the, um, where the gear lockers and the shop were, uh, that mezzanine space, we've purposed that in a couple of different ways. Um, there's one area that will uh, basically serve as kind of a, a training area. Uh, it'll have access to a couple of uh, windows uh, towards the apparatus base so that we can do training in inclement weather. Um, over the shop area will be just uh, some general storage as well as some secured storage uh, for, for a variety of items that we have. So that is a, a quick tour of the fireside and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Any questions for Chief Rowe on the fire side before we move to the PD side? I do not see any hands up. All right. Chief Enema, you want to pick it up from the lobby? Okay. Thank you, Matt. Starting there in the uh, shared lobby, uh, 101 inside that lobby, you'll see a uh, consult room 106 and a consult uh, slash fingerprint room 110. Those are interview rooms. Uh, the, the top one is just strictly an interview room, so we don't have to bring people back into the uh, secure part of the building. That larger consult fingerprint room will be used for uh, public fingerprinting services on that back counter. And then the rest of the room is intended to be set up uh, as a soft interview room, uh, kind of a living room set up uh, to be able to speak to, let's say sexual assault or, or child abuse victims, a little bit more comfortable um, uh, setting. Uh, the other interview rooms in the building are, are down there below 119 and 121. As you can see, those are inside of a, of a door. It's more of a secure area, uh, kind of a little holding area. If you get people inside, they're, they're not free to go all over the building, but you do have a little bit more control. Uh, a unisex toilet uh, between the two of them. So if your person being interviewed needs to use the restroom, you can still maintain some control. And it'll be designed to have uh, water shutoffs on the outside of that. So if you have a, a suspect that's trying to to flush anything that you'll be able to have the water turned off until uh, you can uh, check the uh, check the contents let's say um, above that is uh, uh, our open office area that's a 109 is where our, uh, our three uh, records clerks are going to be located um, the uh, conference room 107 the north wall of that is uh, is our uh, our, basically our glass wall with uh, windows and then we're the south wall of 107 there where we're looking at having uh, that be a glass wall so we can bring that outside light into the open office area. Um, to the east of that is uh, the chief's office and uh, directly below that is a uh, room 111 is a copy work area that will serve the, the chief, the records, and uh, the entire uh, detective uh, division. Uh, the uh, detectives will have an open workroom in um, uh, that room 114. That'll be an open office uh, with workstations. Uh, and the uh, detective commander there is in uh, room 113. That office is a little larger because it also functions as our internal affairs office where uh, that detective commander could uh, uh, interview uh, employees on an internal investigation. Uh, computer forensics uh, 115 is got another secure door. So if you're doing uh, sensitive uh, computer related investigations, child pornography and things like that, that you'll be able to get that, uh, get that computer equipment and those images uh, secured and locked away so they don't, uh, no one has any access to that and we can, we can maintain our, uh, our um, evidentiary chain. Uh, going straight down the hallway, um, you're gonna come to our open uh, break room. 
Uh, as you can see, we've designed that kind of in the center of the building to act as a, as a hub for our activities. People bring in food. It's a kind of a, a social space uh, open to the hallway. So uh, you can see uh, people moving by and uh, just a place for uh, folks to gather. Uh, moving uh, again down that hallway, 127, uh, a simple interior room for record storage. Those are for some of our long-term paper uh, records that uh, we need to, to hold on to. Uh, to the uh, east or to the right of that is our evidence intake. Uh, that's where police officers or detectives come from off the street. They want to drop off evidence. Uh, the, uh, the, the right hand side of that uh, wall has passed through lockers that they can put uh, evidence in and lock it up. And then on the back side of it in the secure processing room 132, 131, uh, our forensics lab, our evidence uh, person can bring that evidence in and either prepare it for forensic work or for storage. Uh, the north part of that room is, uh, is designed to have rolling uh, shelving for general property storage. And then for extra security for drugs and weapons, we have uh, two more rooms that re will require uh, extra uh, security to get into. Uh, we're looking at uh, both uh, probably a dual, um, dual method of entry, uh, an employee key card plus a, uh, a secret code to be able to get in there. Uh, we'll also have uh, cameras in that area uh, because that's a high risk area for, for uh, police operations is uh, drugs and weapons and making sure to, to uh, uh, keep track of those uh, that they don't uh, end up uh, missing. Uh, let's go down to the, the patrol area. Um, the patrol supervisors, that's again a shared uh, office space for uh, three and a, a plus a future patrol sergeant uh, working out of that room. The, uh, the patrol lieutenant, who's uh, the number two person in the department in charge of the patrol division, uh, is, is right there. Uh, we'll have, uh, that's designed, you can see the walls look a little different. We're, we're looking at having glass from about six foot up to the ceiling. So uh, natural light can come through the windows there in the south, go through the lieutenant's office and into those patrol supervisor's office so they can get a little light too. Uh, we're doing the same thing in roll call 136, uh, putting some high windows in there to be able to bring that outside light through the roll, roll call room and into that uh, patrol room that's uh, uh, an interior room that wouldn't get uh, uh, outside light uh, any other way. Uh, this area is kind of the hub for our patrol officers. Uh, three quarters of our uh, staff are patrol and we like to have everything uh, nice and convenient for them. Uh, when they come into work, they're going to park out back, enter through vestibule 153. They'll be able to go down uh, to the locker rooms to the left, uh, men's above and women's uh, to the south, uh, get uh, changed into their work gear, come back down hallway 154 into roll call 136, get their briefing before they go on the street. Uh, pick up some equipment out of uh, patrol 134, and then be able to go right down that hallway 140 and out into, into the garage. Uh, before we go into the garage, I'll go over uh, this area of the building. Uh, the OWI DRE uh, room is uh, where we process uh, drunk, driver, drunk or drugged drivers. Uh, the booking area, 146, is where we do photographs and fingerprints. Uh, we are not having uh, jail cells in this building, uh, but we do have two uh, hardened interview rooms, 148 and 149. Those will be uh, basically concrete block rooms with a door that you can lock. So if you're booking someone in and uh, they're going to be causing a problem and you need to uh, create some space, you can put them in the interview room, close the door, and uh, I'll, you know, allow them to vent in a safe way that we don't have to always go uh, hands-on. Uh, also in that area is a hardened uh, unisex toilet. 
so uh, we don't have to let the uh, the in custody individual out of that that small area. Uh, a high percentage of our people uh, who are under arrest are taken in. We do booking processes and then uh, let them uh, back out. And after I finish the lower corner of the building here, we'll show you how we would release a prisoner. Chief, um, you have a question from Councilman Klein. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, Chief, quick, uh, quick question here. I, I see we're not having regular jail cells. We do have those, I believe, at, at Diamond right now. What's the thought process, the logic behind, behind not having regular jail cells? Okay, uh, that's a great question. Um, first of all, they do not get a great deal of use. Once in a while, we put someone in and hold them for bond, but it does not happen very often. Um, over 90% of the time, we're, we're taking uh, someone and once we're booking them in, we're either releasing them because it's a lower level charge, or if it's a, uh, a higher charge, we'll transport them directly to the Polk or Dallas County jails. Um, Dallas County Jail is building a new jail. It'll be completed later this year. It'll be much closer. Uh, Polk County is a little little farther away, but uh, we feel in the long term it is it's better to get out of the jail business. There's risk involved when you have someone in a jail cell. The first few hours in custody is a, a very high uh, uh, risk for suicidal behavior. And uh, I think it's best for, for us to, uh, if we're gonna have someone in custody, uh, bring those to professionals who deal with custody every day and not just a sideline for us. Uh, another thing that's gonna help is uh, we won't have to be jail certified and we won't have to annually retrain a good deal of our staff uh, to be uh, uh, trained as, uh, as state certified jail monitors. Uh, basically, all those points. Thank you. Yeah, basically, we have to make sure that we don't hold anyone uh, longer than two hours. And if we, if we have that as a part of our policies, uh, we'll be within the uh, the uh, within the state rules. Uh, the any other questions on that? Okay, a couple other rooms before we get out of there. The Armory 152. That's actually a two-room setup with a a cage, a gate in between, uh, where it says armory, that's where our weapons and ammunition storage will be. And then the room on the right, the right hand part of that is uh, basically a gun cleaning and gunsmithing shop where, where we can clean and, and uh, work on uh, malfunctions on, on weapons. Uh, the small equipment room, 151, is designed to just have store any kind of equipment we might need, uh, mostly for patrol. Uh, things like riot shields, uh, tools, uh, just any any number of things that we want to keep secure, but have uh, nearby uh, for our patrol. Okay, if we want to move up into the garage, and I'll just show the example of releasing a prisoner. We've uh, finished booking them in 146. We walk them out into the garage and stay to the outside, go down to the, the, the west part and walk all along that uh, west wall. And this again is inside the garage and we'll have a release vestibule right there. Um, we uh, would prefer to release people uh, away from our main entrance so that we're not releasing them into the lobby. So someone coming to report a crime is not gonna have to cross paths with somebody who's being released. Um, also, if we, if we have someone coming to pick someone up, we can designate a, a parking spot out front so they can pull right up and uh, pick up their uh, their loved one who's being released. Uh, going back into the garage from the, the north, when they, I'm, I'm sorry, from the, yeah, from the north. Uh, when cars enter, uh, they're gonna enter through uh, that side. We've got nine spaces inside uh, the garage. As we mentioned before, we'll use that for siren and light testing before every shift. Uh, the dotted line you see there on the right is a vehicle evidence bay. Uh, from time to time, we have a, a vehicle that needs to be held and processed for evidence. Uh, and we need to make it uh, uh, secure and safe. We'll be able to have a wrecker back up and dump off a, an impounded vehicle in there, close the cage up, and uh, keep that secure for vehicle processing. Also, when we're not using it uh, for uh, vehicle processing, it will 
can function as a tenth parking space uh, inside. So kind of a, a dual purpose. Uh, but if you look at the garage as a whole, we have uh, nine regular spaces, which uh, take care of uh, almost all of our, our fleet. Uh, and, and mostly when they're coming and going, we shouldn't have um, our entire fleet in the garage at any one time. So it should take care of all of our marked uh, vehicles. In the uh, south part of that garage, there's a uh, uh, room for large item storage. Those are big items of evidence that you don't want to try to roll into the uh, into the building. That can be locked in there. The caged area to the left are for uh, uh, temporary holding for evidence, bicycles, and things like that. Um, and then on the right is the exit door. This will be a one way in, one way out. Uh, function. Uh, squad cars can then go out and will turn left and uh, head back up into the, the lot to either go out the, uh, the main entrance where the fire vehicles go or they do have the option of turning uh, right in front of stuff etc and getting out uh, uh, toward uh, uh, 86th Street as well. Uh, I believe that covers everything. If anybody has any questions. Questions for Chief Council? Matt, anything else on your end of it? Uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention is kind of where we're at in the process. Um, at this point, you know, we're at the site plan process and the detailed design phase. Uh, the detailed design set has been sent out for costing with our to our cost estimator. We're expecting a response back here this week or early next uh, on those costings of uh, what the, where the facility is at. As the council can imagine, we're very interested to see where the costing related to construction is at um, right now in the middle of the pandemic and what may come out of the pandemic. Prior to this, our last costing round, uh, the per square footage costs that we were seeing were a little bit higher. Um, we had planned for this in our budget, but they were a little bit higher. So we're kind of curious to see what the market shifts, if there is any that are occurring right now uh, related to the building construction. And also obviously very cognizant of maybe there's difficulties in getting supplies or commodities with uh, kind of any supply chain issues. So that's uh, kind of where we're at at this point. So following if the, the council is uh, supportive of this site plan, we will start developing uh, some of our temporary construction easement documents with our neighboring property owners, uh, the church on the west, and then uh, stuff, et cetera, on the east um, for some of the work that needs to happen on their sites uh, related to a lot of it's related to pavement. Uh, particularly with that shared entrance that we have with the, the church property. Um, we're going to be reconstructing that drive. So we'll be working through that with the two property owners and then uh, developing construction drawings. Uh, we're kind of interested to see, um, as we've been talking about at the facility committee level, um, the legislature was in the middle of considering a bill to provide more flexible project delivery options for uh, public entities in Iowa in terms of how we could do construction of public buildings. Um, I found out today that it sounds like the legislature will be coming back the first week of June. Um, so we're interested to see if they will be considering any policy bills and uh, seeing that bill move forward for approval will at least provide the city another option in terms of project delivery that we're really interested in seeing. And then that our goal would be is once construction documents are developed, uh, and finished here in June and July, that we would be ready then to, to bid the project, um, depending on the delivery options that are available to us with some work happening this fall, you know, potentially major parts or maybe just the flat work. That's some of the things that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, and then eventually for completion of the project in fall uh, 2021 for occupancy. So just wanted to kind of outline where we're at with uh, some of the timeline items and I also know that Angie's on the call and we also have uh, our design team available whether it's um, Matt Carlisle from Confluence who did the site plan and the, and the landscaping plan and then uh, we also have our uh, uh, Bishop Engineering who did the, the civil design for the site plan work. So if there's any questions on anything that we can answer we, uh, we have the whole team available for the council.
Well, Matt, you said it before, and I guess I'll just allude to it again. Uh, you know, the uh, the facility committee, uh, you know, myself and council members Edwards and uh, McCoy, and of course staff and the chiefs and all of our design uh, design team have. Uh, you, you know, we've worked really hard, all of us around this table, to uh, to get to this point. Um, and uh, obviously, a lot of work to go, but I think it, just a lot of great work has been done here. A very, very thoughtful approach. Um, you know, I think I think everybody's sweating these details because it's that important to all of us, and so it's been great to be a part of thus far. And and uh, really, for for Ted's and Susan's and uh, Eric's edification, uh, because the the rest of us have been exposed to it kind of throughout with our facility meetings. Um, uh, really interested in your feedback, and and uh, you know, uh, hopefully moving this forward. Yeah, I think it looks great. Uh, it's great work. Um, yeah, uh, don't have any criticisms or, or or negative feedback. It looks really good to me. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Ted said right there. It looks like really a solid uh, plan, both structurally and, and, and functionally right there. So really congratulate everybody involved. Uh, great job. And I would echo that and also was really impressed with the presentations from the Chiefs. You know, it's always nice to hear from the design side, but to hear it directly from them told me just how closely involved they've been. And it really shows that it's been a thoughtful approach and should work great for the city. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, I think at this point, um, I'd take a motion. Move approval. Second. It's moved by John, seconded by Eric. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? I didn't pass this five to zero. Thanks everyone on that. A lot of years, a lot of years and a lot of hard work getting here. So it's a great, uh, great step for all of us. Okay, we'll move to action item number four, which is a resolution approving uh, participation uh, in the Des Moines Small Business Recovery Grant Program, the amount of $25,000, Matt. Thank you, Your Honor. Just had to get myself unmuted again. Um, so this is just memorializing the conversation the council had at the last meeting, uh, just kind of the final checkbox in terms of the formal financial participation uh, in the small business grant program um, at the, the level of 25,000 that the council is comfortable with. As I've been uh, sharing with the council, this is going to be, um, this financial commitment will leverage other investments from both the county and uh, private fundraising that the Des Moines Partnership is leading, um, generating uh, almost uh, $50,000 in terms of grant funds to be provided to five businesses. Uh, an email I received from the partnership earlier this week indicated we had, I just want to confirm this, 16, 16 applications so far from five businesses that have been received and we still have about a week left to go. And I know uh, Pete and Christy have been working hard to get the word out there uh, in terms of these uh, opportunities for uh, five small businesses to apply to this program. So at this point, uh, included some additional material in the packet uh, also, the listing of the cities that were uh, involved in the program with us. Um, be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, staff would recommend approval. Questions, Council for Matt? Move approval. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Eric. Discussion? Seeing now, will the Council please vote? That item passes five to zero. Thank you, Council. Okay, action item number five is uh, regarding a pay request number five for RDG Planning and Design for Northwest Parks Concept Plans, the amount of $3,913. Move yeah. approval. Second. Moved by uh, John, seconded by Michael. Discussion. Your Honor, I'll be abstaining. Thank you, Council Member Judkins. Any other discussion? 
Seeing none, will the council please vote? That passes five to zero. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to discussion items now. Uh, the first one is regarding COVID-19 recovery, uh, business operation flexibility. And Doug, I believe you have that one. Yes. I wanted to have a discussion tonight revolving around the uh, recent decision by the governor to allow uh, businesses to open back up. As we've been gearing up for this, uh, we've been having conversations with our local businesses uh, related to desires to have some uh, flexibility uh, and, and certainly um, a desire from the business community to have partners in trying to figure out how to uh, get back to some semblance of a normal operation. And as we have had those discussions, uh, most of them have come around uh, a couple or three different uh, areas. Uh, one is related to temporary signage. Um, certainly the businesses feel the need to, to be able to have a little more flexibility in terms of their communication, uh, allowing or providing opportunities to let their customers know, one, that they're open, uh, or two, uh, that they have uh, some kind of uh, change in the way that the uh, uh, property or the building operations are going to occur or three, um, uh, trying to uh, uh, provide, again, more direction in terms of where they should go within a site for pickups and, and things of that nature. So temporary signage has uh, certainly been on the minds of, of a lot of the businesses. Uh, we also have um, uh, businesses that have a desire for having flexibility for the utilization of the outside spaces uh, of their properties whether or not that is uh, bars and restaurants that are looking for uh, ways to uh, try to keep their uh, capacity uh, as high as possible uh, while maintaining safe social distancing parameters. Uh, as you're aware, the, uh, the ability to operate is limited or, or has a limitation to the amount of capacity that they can uh, provide at any one time. Some of them are looking for opportunities to um, get outside, if you will, to create some additional opportunity for, for uh, serving patrons in a safe way. So the flexibility uh, for the outdoor service areas, whether or not that's a, you know, a temporary patio expansion or uh, accommodating uh, tables and chairs on an outside sidewalk area, et cetera. And then the final um, area is a, a little more broad in that, again, uh, some of the businesses are, are going to be taking uh, uh, pickups and, and delivery type functions outside. Um, the one that has been kind of circulating amongst our neighboring communities hasn't quite hit us necessarily, but um, the grocery stores and, and similar type operations where they're doing a, a much more substantial portion of their business as a curbside or, or, or drive up pickup kind of uh, application where they're needing to uh, have some types of uh, facilities, whether or not that's a, a temporary building or maybe it's a collection of uh, storage units or, or other types of uh, ways that uh, allow them to provide that service to the customer outside of the building itself again uh, trying to limit the uh, the health and safety concerns for their their employees and their customers all three of these uh, areas that uh, the businesses are asking for some assistance on we have um, been doing what we can up to this point really informally um, taking a much more relaxed approach to uh, enforcement actions uh, in in each of these areas um, so we have been uh, trying to be as accommodating as possible but as we get to this point of, of having a reopening uh, we thought it was appropriate to have a discussion with council uh, if you will get the proverbial head nod uh, in terms of staff's direction for uh, continuing to work individually with these businesses trying to find ways that we can be accommodating uh, to the safe operation I don't believe that um, it's probably the best use of time to try and craft 
uh, a number of, of new or temporary regulations. We have felt that um, the best way to be flexible, to be nimble, to be accommodating is uh, again, to really work individually with businesses, find ways um, uh, to help them, find ways to uh, meet their needs in a safe way. Um, but because of the uncertainty, because of the, the unknowns that we're dealing with, um, the needs are, are really unique for each business, each property. So we think the best way to deal with this, uh, although it takes more time from us, from our standpoint, but uh, we think it'll be a better service to the customer if we're able to uh, work individually with them. So that's um, uh, generally speaking, kind of the, the desired approach uh, that we think would be most appropriate to our business community. But again, wanted to uh, take the time to uh, make sure we're on the right path and uh, uh, get the direction from council before we really get uh, involved with this over the next few weeks. Councilman Weaver has a question. Well, I just had a, a comment really more than anything. Um, Doug, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, I had breached the subject with Matt a couple weeks ago as well. And um, I wholeheartedly support this. I, I think we need to be as flexible as we can possibly be. Obviously with the, with the parameters of safety always under consideration, but and I think taking it on a case-by-case -case basis is the exact right approach. So um, I applaud you for this and, and I thank you for it because I, I think our businesses need it. And, you know, we're always worried about setting precedent, but we're in unprecedented times. And so I, I don't think we have to worry about that right now. We just need to do what's best for our businesses. So um, I fully support it. Other questions or comments for Doug, Council? Well, Doug, I, I, I'm going to echo Ted's comments. Uh, I think this is something that's very important uh, for us to do. And um, I think we're, we're well equipped, um, certainly with the people talent that we have, uh, to implement uh, these types of suggestions that you brought forward, uh, but then also to, to uh, rein them back in when we need to do that at the appropriate time. Um, again, it's the people skill set that we have that, uh, that really allows us to do that and, and makes us be effective when we do it. So uh, very, very supportive of the effort. Uh, Council, any other uh, questions or discussion items for Doug? Okay. I'd just like to ask one quick question. Um, Doug, are we proactively communicating this to, to the business community or is, are we just waiting for them to come to us? Yeah, so it, it kind of comes in two different forms. Uh, yes, we do have a lot of inquiries from businesses, um, mostly on, on kind of the, the bigger topics of, you know, can I use the outside space for X, Y, or Z, or can I get an expansion of a patio? Things that um, maybe would have otherwise been um, something that would require a, a more detailed site plan, maybe PNZ or council review, things of that nature. You know, our businesses are very good about asking us generally uh, before they just go out and do it. Um, as it relates to the signs, um, that's that's a little bit different story. Uh, honestly, we have a lot of signs out there, like I said, over the last few months that um, we just um, are not really uh, doing an active enforcement on. Um, so I think a lot of cases, the businesses kind of see their neighbors and, and, and kind of just run with it, which is perfectly fine from our perspective. Uh, we have not done any kind of announcement or you know anything along those lines. Again, taking it very much as a, a case by case informal basis. Um, we will um, have the opportunity, I think, uh, now that we we have this additional flexibility with managing some of these outdoor things uh, based on your folks's concurrence to allow us to do that. Uh, that we'll be able to to uh, reach back out to those people that have inquired. And then, like I said, um, I, I would fully anticipate that um, word of mouth will spread uh, in terms of um, uh, businesses reaching out to us and, and having conversations about uh, what their needs are. Hey, Doug, it's Eric. I appreciate you getting out in front of this. And I, I know that uh, Clyde Business really appreciate the flexibility as well. You know, it is difficult and unprecedented times. And anything we can do as a city to to assist them, I think is a good thing. So do appreciate it.
Well, I appreciate the commentary. I think uh, Doug wrote really, uh, excuse me, what you need is, is direction and uh, you're getting some of it. Um, it's a little tougher to, uh, to see heads nodding uh, uh, up and down around the dais uh, when we're used to being together. So um, I'm seeing John nodding his head there. That's great. I, I certainly uh, am not. Well, hey, there's a big glare sense. there, John. You need to get rid of that camera. <laughs> Michael, did you have something? No, I'm certainly not one to go against Weaver tonight, so uh, my head's nodding. Okay, very good. Susan, any comments? No, nothing to add. I disagree. Okay, so this is something that you're really not in favor of doing, or? Just no, I, said, I just agree. I'm sorry. Oh, you to... agree. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's even better. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Yep. Uh, so it, it, it appears that we have a consensus around the table uh, for your suggestions. And uh, again, uh, applaud your efforts here. I know and understand this, this, this creates, you know, additional work uh, for, for you and, and for everybody, but uh, it's the right thing to do. And um, well, I would appreciate you moving forward with it. And we'll look forward to tracking your progress. Okay, good. Anything else on that one? Matt? Nothing? Okay. We'll move to the second discussion item then, and this is regarding leisure services programming uh, and COVID-19 discussion. A whole bunch of information here. And uh, Richard, why don't you kick us off? All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just, before I get into some of the recommendations that we're talking about here and updates on the programming and facilities, I, I wanna the, thank the, the leisure services team. In, in the past two months, they've really had to completely reinvent the services that they provide to the city's residents, the users of our parks and our trails, as well as uh, the patrons of the, the public library. They've done an incredible job of learning how to re-engage all those people in, in ways that they never had to do before. We've done things such as virtual programming for our Taekwondo. We've had soap carving uh, virtual programming. The library's done a great job of re-engaging their book clubs virtually as well as doing story times uh, online as well. And even trying to get people out into the park system. We did a scavenger hunt, uh, I think a week or two ago that engaged 73 teams that got people out and about in a safe way and, and really seeing different elements of the community and, and finding ways to, to make sure that they can survive this major change that we've had. And so I just wanna thank them for, for everything that they've done and continue to do to really find ways to, to re-engage and reinvent what we do. But heading into the summer season here, we really have two major things that are probably the most attended, which is the Aquatic Center as well as Clive Festival that uh, really impact uh, the community. And so what we wanted to do is bring forward a couple recommendations and, and get your thoughts and feedback on that. The first one is the Aquatic Center. Uh, this is our, our premier uh, facility that uh, um, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people attend each year. And staff has done a great job of looking at all the possibilities, seeing if it's even possible to open the facility this year. If it is, how could we do that? How could we do it in a safe way that would allow people to uh, come out to the aquatic center and really enjoy that like they do in a normal year? We've done a lot of communication with neighboring communities, uh, seeing what they're gonna do. We've worked with the Department of Public Health. We've researched a lot of the CDC guidelines and we really just come to the point where we think that it's really not possible to open the, uh, the aquatic center this season for open swimming. There's a, a lot of things that go into that. One is we believe that the amount of capacity that would be allowed in there would be very small. In a normal year, about 900 people can be in the aquatic center at any given time. It's not always that way, but they can be. Um, we really believe that if aquatic centers are even allowed to open this year, either through the state or through CDC guidelines, probably only about 50 people would be allowed in that facility. And when we started to look at the, the cost to operate it, the amount of people we would need to staff it, we really felt like that wasn't a, a good fiscal uh, decision from that standpoint, as well as it also be the increased costs and a lot less revenue to keep all those social distancing up, uh, cleaning it on a much more regular basis. So we're really recommending at this point that we don't open the aquatic center, which will be a major, major frustration for a lot of people, even though they understand what's going on. People are used to associating the aquatic center with summer. And so 
uh, we know that that will be something that will have a lot of impacts throughout the community. One thing we have researched, and while we're not recommending we do it, if the council wanted us to, we do believe there would be an opportunity to offer swimming lessons. It can be done, it's tricky, um, but would just need to be done in a little bit differently than in the past. So it, there's availability to do that, but at this point we don't believe that the benefits outweigh the, the risks and maybe some of the, the problems that would come along with that. The second major thing that we're uh, recommending is that we cancel the Clyde Festival this year. Uh, we've been uh, working with the Clyde Chamber of Commerce and Christy there to understand uh, about the ability to uh, go out and find sponsorships to help that event occur. Um, we're also looking at the state's guidelines for gatherings and don't see a, a situation where we'd be able to get that many people in one location. And uh, we really felt like this year it was best to just cancel it. Um, and not have to reach out to some of those businesses that are hurting, but find a way in some way to celebrate uh, Clive like we do every year. So we've got a couple of different options here. Uh, the first one is, would be to take the, the more limited food truck Friday that's been very popular out of Campbell Park and move that over to uh, the, the aquatic center area on Friday, July 17th and do an expanded food truck Friday there along with a limited fireworks show. And one of the things we could do there is if for some reason, social distancing and guidelines from the state still didn't allow us to have those gatherings, we're recommending that uh, we still have the fireworks no matter what. Uh, people are allowed to gather in some ways either in their cars, um, and we think we could pull that off. Another great thing is we've been able to secure a sponsorship for that that covers uh, about 60% of that cost. Uh, Smart Honda has stepped up and uh, put a four to five thousand uh, dollar sponsorship that would help us to provide those fireworks so we think in some way you know even though we're greatly impacted by everything going on there's some way to celebrate like we would uh, in every other year to do that so a couple contingency plans as well in regards to a lot of our other programming throughout uh, the summer that we normally do we think there's a possibility of doing some of that but we just don't know yet so we're waiting on additional guidance which we expect to be offered by the state by the end of the month. If that's the case, there's a potential to potentially have our softball and volleyball leagues, uh, some of our other small events that we have each year, but we're just waiting at this point to know what the possibilities are. So there may be some additional cancellations with that, but just wanted to, to make you aware that we haven't had to cancel everything yet. No matter what happens here, uh, we will continue to reinvent and uh, find ways to provide services to the, the residents of Clive, our, our facility users, as well as the library patrons. Uh, one thing that's happening and actually starting tomorrow, the library is uh, opening up curbside material checkout. So we've seen a, a big demand from uh, patrons to find a way to get some of the materials back out of the library. 1,000 uh, materials were checked out right before we closed, and we're finding that people have finally gone through all that, and they're, they're looking at a need to get some of those materials back out. So we're excited and uh, really seen a strong demand from people wanting to do that. So starting tomorrow and going from here on out, Monday through Friday, 11 to 2, you'll be able to do a virtual checkout of materials on the city's website or on the city, the library's app and then you'll be able to come to the library itself and pick those items up. So we're, we're seeing people excited about that and finding ways to still provide those services. So excited about that as well as some of the other possibilities of reinventing services this summer. I think with that, I, I would be open to any questions or comments that, that the council might have regarding this. Richard, I wanna thank uh, you and, and the team for really thinking this through. Uh, <laughs> You know, looking at every web series, you can probably imagine, and and to your point, there is so much that we don't know uh, as it relates to timing and numbers of people. Uh, so I, I know a lot more to come there. I'm interested, though, in how uh, I would ask you to elaborate or expand on the swim lesson, the viability of swim lessons, and how that makes sense. So uh, what the issue has been up to this point has been that you can't really have that one-on-one -on -one contact. And most of the swimming lessons require contact with the, the patron uh, in most of the swimming levels. 
what uh, has been explored and talked about and we think would be a possible situation is at those levels, we would probably just cut the classes in half and then the parent would have to be engaged in the water with the student instead of the lifeguard and how that would normally be done. Social distancing would all still be, a, uh, be enforced between all the other swimming lesson participants. Uh, so we believe it could be done. We just don't know if it, it makes the most sense. Uh, we have seen and heard some different comments from people. Some wouldn't want to get in, some parents can't swim, some were, would be okay with it and some have other kids that they didn't feel like they could leave on the deck while they were helping their, their child participate in swimming lessons. So while it could physically be done and believe we could follow all social distancing guidelines and accomplishes that, just feel like it's maybe not worth, uh, worth that this summer and then focus on finding other virtual ways to educate and train people this summer. Maybe we could just uh, refer them to Swim with Kim. Easy. <laughs> well, that would be one option. And so let me follow up there. So, so what about what is West Des Moines doing then with with possible swim lessons? And I'm I'm interested in ramp up costs as well there, Richard. But um, you know, are they looking at maybe doing it something at Holiday or or you know maybe a smaller facility that might be more conducive with lower ramp up costs? Or how is that factoring into your your planning? Yeah, so we've, we've had extensive discussions with the city of West Des Moines about where they're at and what they're wanting to do. And while they haven't made any official recommendations yet, um, that's kind of what we've heard as well, is that they're exploring possibilities of that at, at Holiday and seeing if that's something that they can do as well. We, we've run uh, some of the costs, and we believe at least from the swimming lesson standpoint and the staff costs there, the, it could be potentially pretty revenue neutral, but that doesn't take into account the the cost to actually operate the pool for that period of time. Yeah, and that would be my question uh, as it relates to that. Um, last thing for me, um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions here. Um, so food truck Fridays, we would we would look to continue that based on guidance uh, protocols, uh, obviously, but we would look to continue that maybe put more emphasis on those as we move through the summer and then uh, into early fall. Correct, yeah, if, if the governor changes some of the guidelines here um, towards the end of the month, we believe it might be possible to have the food truck Fridays, but we're also prepared that um, we're, we just might have to cancel the entire, entire season. Uh, that's something that we'll probably need another two weeks before we can really make a call on that. We've been in touch with some of the vendors and have been working with the, the, the chamber just to be prepared for that. We already have canceled the, the May versions of those um, and think that should some of those social distancing guidelines be eased just a little bit, there's a, a certain possibility of this, but also know that the cancellations could come here by the end of the month. As it relates to that, and I, I apologize, I'm asking a lot of questions here, but- um, Oh, you're good. As it relates to the fireworks show, is, is July too early potentially for that? Are you keeping an open mind on that or is that kind of when you, you're thinking that you would want to do that? So uh, we believe that the July date would be okay because um, what we're looking at, if that's the only thing that we could do, we believe what we do is set people up in a way that they just had to stay in their cars to watch the fireworks show and work with the aquatic center parking lot, the gravel lot, potentially sure. reach out to Mercy and some of their parking lots up the hill there and, and find a way to have some sort of limited celebration, but maintaining that, that social distancing. We believe that, um, that that is something that's actually already allowed. Uh, the drive-in movie theaters is something that's already allowed and that would be a much similar setup to that. Sure, okay, thank you, Richard. Council, other questions and discussion for Richard? Councilman Weaver, do you still have a question? Yeah, I've got a few different things. Um, so I love the idea of the fireworks. Um, I, I, I definitely think we should uh, uh, proceed with that. I, I think people are going to need outlets, right? And um, I, I think that's just a, a great idea. So I applaud you guys on that. Um, on the swim lessons, just to circle back on that a little bit, um, you're saying it's revenue neutral. Uh, in, your, in your memo, it, it mentioned that there, it might be at a loss. Um, so do we have a sense for what that loss would look like if we did offer that? Because I think we can, we can mitigate the issue of 
people not wanting to get in. I mean, you just let people know in advance, here's how we're going to do it. And then they either sign up or don't based off of that. Right. So I think we can minimize that issue, but what's the, the dollar figure that we're looking at here? Do you have any sense for that? So um, just a rough number. And obviously we're, we're trying to figure out what percentage of the lessons would be filled under a scenario like this. Um, we looked at, it would probably be per session. So if we did two sessions, it's about a $500,000 loss just on, we're looking at staff time um, and, and making sure that the pool's up and running. There's still a lot of things associated with paying for the water to fill the pools and keep them balanced through that time that we haven't calculated. So are you saying 500 to to $1,000 per sessions or for the whole per set? So if we did two sessions, we think that we'd lose about 500 to to $1,000. So from that perspective, about $2,000 of loss from there. Okay. Because we would only do a couple sessions during the summer. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That, we thought there's a possibility to maybe do two back-to-back -back sessions in July. Uh, it limits the amount of time the pool would be up and operating um, so that you didn't have that long season of uh, keeping a pool going. All right, so, so just my opinion, that, that, that seems like a fairly nominal loss and, and would be a nice service to provide for those who want it. Um, so just, just my thoughts on that. On the Aquatic Center, uh, I totally agree with the, the idea of shutting it down for the season. I think that's the right decision. Would we provide it as an option to private parties? Who wanted to rent it out themselves would that be an option most likely not because at that point you're really engaging in a, a ton of the costs you're going to have to bring on all the lifeguards to staff the entire thing for those those events and you really just wouldn't bring in enough revenue to come anywhere close to, to covering all those costs okay fair enough and then last thing i'll say is on the on the softball um side of thing or on, on the rec leagues um i definitely want to encourage us to try to think outside the box and and do what we can to as best we can still have those if possible um i, I talked to matt earlier today about this i'm on the Wanna creek baseball board of directors and you know we're having to do the same thing and, and we're looking at, at, at if there's any way we can have a baseball season this summer we're going to do it and if that means that we have to limit the park to only parents because we got to socially distance and they got to line up all around the the outfield and the sidelines you know that's what we're going to do if we, we can only have one set of catcher's gear then you can only have one catcher you can't you can't trade that between between kids and if we got to wipe down the balls in between innings you know whatever we got to do we need to try to do that because people are going to need this kind of a recreational outlet. So I just want to encourage us to, to think along those lines. Yeah, at this, at this point, it's something we're preparing for. Um, we've adjusted schedules. Um, we've been working with the umpires to, uh, to be a go for our softball leagues this summer, uh, starting probably in the, in the first part of June, should the socially distancing and the guidelines from the, the state allow that. So, Right now, it's, it's something we're planning for. Um, we just don't know at this point if we're gonna be able to pull it off. We've been in a lot of contact with uh, other agencies, so Des Moines and, and West Des Moines and Ankeny to discuss where they're at, and they're all in the same boat. They, they would like to, to get them in, and they haven't canceled them yet, and they're just trying to, to figure out if that's gonna be a possibility here. All right, okay, thank you. Councilman Klein, do you have a question? I do, yeah, and some of it has already been answered. One was, you know, looking at the financial model on the swimming lessons, and it, it looks like just a couple of thousand dollar loss on that. I think that in the overall scheme of things, that's just a good thing to do to our citizens right there, um, even though it is for a, a modified type of lesson in a short amount of time. I, I think it's, you know, I, I'm willing to, to parlay that loss right there. And as far as, you know, Clyde Festival and, uh, uh, food truck Fridays. Again, a lot of that's going to depend on, on what the guidance is from the governor moving forward in the crowd, things of that nature. But, you know, I, I think uh, to keep up the tradition is, is certainly a good thing. We need to find ways to do that. And I applaud your staff for being creative and look at those options. So uh, I, I, I'm in favor of what I've heard so far. 
You know, one of the things we could do related to swimming lessons, if, if that's a direction that the council wanted us to, to pursue, um, we could certainly put the interest out there and, and see if we would get enough participation in the lessons. Um, and maybe there's a break even point on X amount of people per lessons that makes it viable enough that uh, we don't lose a ton of money. Um, and maybe that's a way to, to gauge some interest and see if people are willing to do that um, despite the, you know, having to get in the water and some of the social distancing. So that's a possibility as well. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Councilman Edwards has a question. Yeah, I agree with the majority of the discussion with the exception of uh, swimming lessons. The, it seems like the cost benefit, it's not really a cost issue for me, you know, whether we're losing a thousand or two thousand dollars or whatever. It's the uh, risk to those who are involved. Uh, I mean, it's, I guess I'm just not that familiar with how you stop in water effectively and, you know, I mean, it just seems to me there would be a risk there. You've got to get a, 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 the pool filled, which would not be filled otherwise. You've got to get staff involved and because of social distancing, you've got to get parents and others involved. It seems to be a far cry from uh, the type of lessons that we typically would give and the quality it seems to me could suffer i i just i would not go down that road at all other thoughts on this one council i do, i have a question and that is i listened to the polk county supervisors update today so in addition to the guidance that we're hearing from the governor we do have guidance coming from the county and um, they're heavily recommending that the cdc guidelines on mask wearing be followed to protect employees in public spaces so i didn't hear much about that and i'm wondering what our guidance is recommended to be yeah, that certainly played into our recommendation of not doing the swimming lessons either. Um, we feel like based on everything we've read, we don't want to do that or we don't think we, uh, it's a, a good risk to put out there, but we can uh, find ways to do that to keep the lifeguards and everyone that comes into those facilities. We've talked about things such as in between sessions, altering and putting more space between them, having people exit certain uh, facility doors and enter into different facility doors, uh, cleaning as much as possible. Uh, I mean, if there's one benefit, the, the water itself does um, does not allow that to be uh, the virus to be transferred from what everything we read, the, the chemicals in it uh, kill that off. But it's when you're not in the pool are the, the, the risk and some of those things. and would we require face masks for anyone not in the pool? So a lot of things along with that, we wanted to, wanted to give it as an option for the council, um, knowing how canceling the aquatic season is, would be very impactful to the, the city's residents and the, the users of that facility. Yeah, that makes good sense. And reading the part of the memo about the library too, um, I didn't really see a reference to how as we move forward, that'll be managed. And it's, I guess, something we can talk about later, but I just think it, it makes sense to be willing to provide people with um, good guidance, whether we choose to require as some people are, or just to um, strongly recommend. I think we should be clear about making that recommendation in the interest of our own employees. And I, in, in regards to your question about the library or, or comment about the library, uh, that will be something that we'll, we'll have significant discussion with our staff as well as Matt uh, about how do we approach that when we start to look at a limited opening of allowing people back into the library. Uh, I think at this point we're very comfortable with uh, seeing how the curbside material checkout goes and, and seeing how popular that is and see if that helps uh, provide the service to our patrons without creating that risk at this time. Good, thanks. 
Oh, one other thing I want to add about the Aquatic Center, um, actually just prior to this meeting, uh, the city of Cedar Rapids announced that they will not be opening their Aquatic Center and uh, will not be hosting any swimming lessons. That's the, the first uh, city that we know of across the state of Iowa that has actually made that call. We do think now that that's happened and we're having this discussion here that uh, we'll start to see quite a few other communities uh, make a call on their pools and swimming lessons here in the next two weeks. So it seems that we that there's obviously consensus about about not operating the aquatic center for the season. I think there's probably um, a, a slight mix on whether you whether you try to offer swim lessons or not. Um, you can probably go with the other on that, uh, Richard. Just so I'm clear, it's it's staff's recommendation that you don't offer swim lessons based on. Um, <clears throat> You know all the the things that would be sacrificed as as part of that, not just costs, but but actually how do you actually do it? Yes, that's and, correct, Mayor. And be effective with it, um, Council. Are there other questions yeah. or comments that can give Richard some guidance? Yeah, I have. A, I, I don't know how to put my hand up, so I apologize. But um, I I am torn on this one uh, because I understand. Weaver's comments, and I think everybody agrees, I'd have to think even Professor Edwards agrees, <laughs> that, I mean, we, we've got to figure out things for the kids. Uh, and it is a lot of pressure on Richard and, and his group uh, for the summer. I'd be open to listening to this a little bit more. The Aquatic Center, yeah, and I think we need to make a decision to, to cancel that. The swim lessons, I'm still open to listen warm to it because again you're going to see an increase in other things happening right so bring back the bridge uh you know and the kids on the trail and the creek and all that stuff because it's gonna happen and they've got to have outlets you know i'm down by city hall to with those uh, sheep and goats uh, most every day at least once and there are dozens and dozens of people that come down just down there to see them. Uh, and Doug and Richard and his crew are doing a great job moving them around and letting people be able to see them. They tell me that they come down every day from their house just to get out. That's just going to grow even more, greater and greater through the summer. So we got to figure out something, that, you know, maybe some lesson isn't the right idea, uh, but we got to come up with some very creative things. Or we're gonna have the Weaver boys and Cena boys jump into the creek again. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a very good point, uh, Michael. And you know, I, I know in the report as we talk about planning for the future with our other recreational programming, and a lot of that has gone to virtual. But but I think I, I for personally, my challenge, Richard, to you and your group would be to Michael's point. Let's figure out ways to do the things that we can do for the rest of our programming, kind of across that spectrum. There are certain things from, uh, you know, like the Aquatic Center that are fairly defined in terms of staffing, timing, costs, et cetera, et cetera. But, but how do we, as we move forward, make ourselves flexible enough or give ourselves enough flexibility to where if we decide that we can do something and do it the right way, then we, that we do it, that we get creative, that we be bold and different. And we may not know what that is today. Maybe three weeks or 30 days from now, we may have an idea. So I think to Mike's point, we've got to be able to give ourselves the flexibility going forward and not create the environment this evening um, that, that we're not going to try anything and that we're not going to try to be creative and, and be bold in our solutions. Because to Ted's point, we got we got to have these kids doing something, and um, I may be jumping off the bridge with them. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I'm I'm sure Chief will be there to to pull you out as well. So, it, uh, <laughs> but it's, so, that. so that that would be my my comment on that, and and um, you know again that's a, that's I think that's just a friendly challenge. Other comments before we. Uh, move off of this item. Matt has a comment. Matt, go ahead. Matt. 
Thank you, Your Honor. I, I guess one suggestion that I would offer uh, to, to Richard's point is uh, per, on the swimming lesson issue, that is something, if, particularly if we're waiting till July, even if we were gonna do anything that we don't need to decide today, I think the bigger question was the aquatic center is, and in terms of its normal operations. Perhaps, you know, as Richard, you know, as Richard suggested, maybe we do some, some surveying and kind of get a, maybe an understanding of what the, kind of get the council some more information on this since you, you guys are kind of split in terms of where we might go on that. Uh, to council member McCoy's point, let's get you some more information on that. And then we can bring that back at a later date because we do have some time um, before we need to make a decision on the swimming lesson point is what I would offer. And I would also suggest that the jumping off the bridge is happening already and, and has ramped up. So we have been getting a, a variety of complaints on that. So it has started to occur. Matt, have we increased um, the patrols down there to, to deal with that at all? I'll let the I'll let Chief the Chief speak to that. I know that we've uh, been responding to calls down there. So Chief, yeah, we no comment. Uh, yeah, we we have been responding to calls. We've had uh, throughout the spring. We've had four uh, calls, but um, most of the time we're finding uh, the kids are jumping off the bridge, which, as you know, is is legal. Uh, uh, forcing social distancing on a group of teenagers is a is a challenge. Um, so I I agree it's it's going to be an issue. I don't think it's going to go away. Uh, we've seen a, an increase on uh, vandalism and things all over the city. I think there's a lot of bored kids out there, and uh, it's going to lead to some some problems. We we are uh, continuing bicycle patrols. We do that. On, on an overtime basis and responding to any complaints that come in. Yeah, Chief, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, I just no, no, okay. to say, Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, you know, I mean, the bridge jumping thing obviously is, is an annoyance, but I guess for me and, and the way we did the ordinance, the, the bigger concern is the loitering on the bridge, especially with the whole social distancing thing and, and, and people being nervous. Uh, you know, with that, and and so if we start getting a bunch of teenagers there blocking the bridge, I think that's where we're really going to have some issues more than anything. Ted, I agree, and you know, got an email uh, this week uh, with a couple of emails actually about not just that issue, but um, you know, really how do we how do we? And I know this get a little off topic here, but how do we enforce social distancing uh, in our protocols? Um, but but specific to the bridge jumping and the loitering, um, you know, we crafted that ordinance pretty carefully after a whole lot of thought and discussion with full counsel and, and legal counsel uh, on not being able to climb on that structure. And, you know, not jumping off, but not being able to climb on the structure. So I think we need to look at that, number one. I think number two, um, we have social distancing protocols now from the state of Iowa, and we, you know, if, if, if educating doesn't work, then we have to figure out what we have to do. And so um, I don't, I don't want to stop short at saying that jumping off the bridge is legal. We took great to ensure that that wouldn't happen because we made it illegal to climb on the structure. So I'm going to ask us to take a look at that and, and, and have a sidebar on that. But to Ted's point and to Matt's point, a lot of these things are already starting to happen. And so we all want the best for, for our kids. We want the best for what's, you know, uh, for what can happen in our community. And we have a really uh, creative staff. Um, and so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to um, come up with some bold, creative things to do uh, that we can uh, do and do it well. Uh, uh, for the summer and, and early fall. So I think this is great discussion. Uh, these are tough discussions, obviously unprecedented. Um, but uh, yeah, the sad news is, is that it's, it's not going away anytime soon. So we have, we have opportunities, I think, to adapt and be as nimble as possible. Uh, unless there's something further on this, uh, on this topic, um, I'm gonna move us off of this topic. Uh, Mayor, to one moment. Mayor, one moment. Councilman Edwards has his hand up. Councilman. Yeah, John, go ahead. 
Just to conclude, I wanted to say I'm 100% in agreement with Councilman McCoy and Weaver that we do need to find something for these kids to do. I'm just not sure it's swim lessons. So that's my only comment. I, I'm 100% agreement. Our, we, as you said, Mayor, we've got a creative staff, staff. They can figure out some programs that would work within the con confines we have. Indeed. Thank you, John. Okay, we're going to move to reports now. And Pete, I'm going to go down to your end of the dais and start with you. Thank you, Your Honor. So, uh, circling back to the discussion we had about the site plan for the public safety building, I jokingly say this, but um, the IT department, we like to think of it as one big building with a great data center that just happens to co locate with a police department and a fire department. The facility that's there creates a whole lot of opportunities for us to keep improving the network environment for the city. And we look forward to, at a later date, uh, talking about what some of those things, some of those improvements are going to be. Dennis has done a nice job working closely with the design team and with staff, uh, starting to imagine what real good we can get out of this opportunity we have to keep building a strong and resilient network that supports all of the facilities and all the different functions of the team. Uh, if you were wondering, I just checked the gauges too for how much rain we got. We looked like we were one of the higher points thus far for these storms that have been coming through. We got about 1.3 inches in just over an hour at the 8035 gauge. Uh, the creek's doing fine last that I, I looked at it, but it was quite a burst and it's a good reminder of the season that we are very much in the middle of now as we keep watching the creek and thinking about how we are preparing to keep property and people safe as we go into the flood season. So that will obviously be an important part of our communications going into um, the rest of the end of the spring and the very first part of the summer when we know we get some of our most intense rainfalls. Next, uh, the resident survey and the online resident survey are now closed. And in the coming weeks, we'll be receiving our initial reports from our surveying partner about the, the citizen satisfaction. So we look forward to bringing that to council to review and to glean insights from in the uh, some of, in one of the upcoming meetings here at the beginning of the of, in, uh, excuse me at the beginning of the summer. Final points on the last are all about uh, COVID and our response. Obviously, with the small business program, we are going to give that keep giving that a big big push because we want to see as many eligible Clive businesses get into that program and put forward their best foot about uh, why this is a, a program that was a good fit for them and why this they are. Uh, a good fit for this investment from the taxpayers and from, from the private business partners. So watch for more communications on that. We are also anticipating uh, that we will be polling the community using our new online polling platform to see how folks are adapting as we move further into the next stages of the pandemic response, identifying some of their needs and what some of their behaviors are as well. Uh, some other Iowa communities, Bettendorf, recently did that and found that they got some very good insights from businesses and from residents so that they could understand what the city might be doing or what the city possibly could do next to, to continue supporting all of the residents and businesses moving into the next phase. Uh, we don't have a timeline for when we would do that, but we do have the tool in our box at this point. And it, as Matt and I have been talking about it, we're thinking that a, a sometime here in the, in the summer would make good sense. Finally, we get to do a lot of very fun storytelling still with the goats to keep building up community morale. I'm pleased to report that we got through some supply chain channel uh, troubles and have now made our order for some green bolt goat uh, cloth face masks. And we've also put together a sort of a special edition of the green belt goat t-shirt as well. And our intention is to sell those and take the proceeds and make a donation to Clive Community Services. And uh, we look forward to building up some good community response around that program. The nice thing about the t-shirts too is they include on the back text that uses the Clive Pride and the DSM strong hashtags and tells people to uh, stay healthy, be safe, and that we are all together going to get through this. Pete, hey, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, council questions for Pete. Okay, well done, Pete, thank you. Ted, we'll move down to you. Uh, nothing to nightmare. Okay, thank you, Ted. Uh, Eric? Uh, no report tonight, Mayor. Thank you, sir. John? 
A uh, couple of things. Uh, today, there was a news release from uh, Des Moines. They've uh, extended the uh, denial of use permits through July 1. So things are going to be locked down in Des Moines. It sounds like in, at least until July 1. So if you didn't see that release, I wanted to point that out. Secondly, I wanted to thank uh, those of you that have completed and submitted your evaluation of our city manager. I much appreciate having those from you. And those of you that haven't, I would appreciate getting those by Monday, if at all possible. Thank you very much. Well, I feel like I'm back in school once again. <laughs> the latest time, but no, I did not. I did turn mine in. I must say that. But uh, John, thank you, and uh, yeah, uh, Council, thank you for uh, for your timely uh, submittal of those and um, make the processes going well again this year with the groundwork that we laid last year. So appreciate that very much. Thank you, John. Uh, Susan. Well, I just report that I have heard from several different nonprofits that they appreciated the meeting they had with staff of Bravo to give them an update of the pretty dire outlook for um, the near term. Um, they're seeing various funding sources dry up, so they feel that it's given them some time to plan. We have another finance committee meeting. I do serve on the finance committee coming up, I believe it's next week, um, for some further updating. So that remains an ongoing concern. Um, and then I just say I had an opportunity to present to a group today um, online about watershed management authorities. Seemed to be pretty well attended, 40 some people. And so it was a nice opportunity to say a little bit about what we're doing in Clive and beyond for the rest of the state. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. I hope you were social distancing. <laughs> yes, from all the way out here in Maryland, I was. <laughs> Very good. Questions for Susan, Council? Thank you, Susan. Uh, Michael? Just two quick comments. Um, one, not to get anyone in trouble by the process of elimination, but I got mine in early by accident, but I got mine in early uh, for uh, the uh, eval. So it's not me, so we can narrow it down now. Second Teacher's is, bad. Uh, Teacher's thank, bad. You, thank you. Second, it was accidental. Second, uh, I am glad to hear tonight from uh, straight from Pete that uh, affirming what I thought Dennis is in fact the person behind the entire public safety building uh, happening. I thought that for a long time, uh, but tonight solidified that. So thanks. I knew it was an IT building in disguise. That's all. <laughs> Ellen, Michael, you're proof that some of the best things can happen by accident. <laughs> right? That's what my parents yeah. said too. I was to say, more ways than one. Uh, other than snide comments, are there questions for Michael while we have him? <laughs> Okay, very good. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Madam Council, anything for the good of the order? Uh, I have one item for clarification of the record. Um, looking at action item five this evening, the votes uh, were published by the screen that demonstrated um, five votes in favor, but in reviewing the actual polling of the votes that were, were made through the technology from the council members, um, council member um, Judkins did abstain, so I just wanted to validate yeah. that for the record and um, I guess offer any discussion or, or clarification from others if needed. Uh, no, that's right. That's exactly right. Susan did abstain from that. And uh, Thank you. I think I called that. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank Nothing you, further then. Very good. Matt. Thank you, Your Honor. Just a couple quick items tonight. Um, the uh, mayoral proclamation um, it will, that the, uh, the mayor and I have been working on will uh, come out tomorrow and that will extend uh, the closures kind of based off of the governor's uh, extension to the end of the month, oh, not quite, but close to the end of the month, uh, particularly related to playgrounds. Um, Richard kind of talked about our library strategy 
Uh, we'll also have um, some information in there. It kind of relates a little bit to what uh, Councilmember Edwards talked about with Des Moines, having some uh, temporary limits on uh, special event permits and block party permits. Uh, just kind of recognizing that, that is, uh, that's something we hadn't had in the proclamation before. It was a good thing to, to include at this time. So that will be coming out tomorrow. We'll be sending a copy to the council uh, once the mayor signs that order. We wanted to have the discussion on the Aquatic Center tonight uh, before we uh, before we issued that. Um, anything else, Scott, that, or your honor, that you wanted to mention related to that proclamation? No, thanks, Matt. I um, appreciate the help and Christina's help and just making sure that, uh, uh, that we have it right. And, um, you know, hopefully we won't be issuing any more of those proclamations in, in the near future, but for now, that's where we are. Thank, Thank you. you. And the last thing that I had is just to make the council aware and uh, uh, council member Jedkins and the mayor are, are very well aware. Um, we've been starting some dialogue with the country club owners association regarding uh, the recommendation that we received from a traffic study that both the cities of Clive and Urbandale commission to evaluate the intersection of Country Club Boulevard and Hickman Road for the potential for a traffic signal. Um, based on certain safety uh, uh, items, the study is recommending um, signalization at that intersection. Uh, the Country Club Owners Association uh, board um, has uh, have some uh, significant objections to it. Um, petition has started, so uh, the mayor and I have been receiving some emails, and I know Susan's had communications on this as well with uh, folks in the Country Club neighborhood. Just wanted to make the council aware that we're having dialogue with the Country Club Owners Association Board. We have a meeting set for later this month to talk through the traffic study and the information, really kind of a fact-finding mission is the way I would term it with them in terms of their concerns. I think that there's some perceptions of issues, but we really want to maybe get down to the facts and then uh, have a discussion with you all about, um, depending on but that dialogue with them of, of whether or not um, the council wants to move forward with uh, working with Urbandale on that signal. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that, just in case you were, you were to see any uh, uh, communication from constituents on that, other than what's been shared with Scott and Councilmember Jedkins and I. So uh, any questions on that? That's all I have, Your Honor. Matt, thank you. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, more certainly more to come there, and uh, it's just going to require some sit down dialogue, I think, um, to, to kind of work through that. So, appreciate you bringing that up tonight. Um, so, I would ask uh, Matthew any correspondence that uh, we need to be aware of. No, Your Honor, nothing further. Council, is there anything else for the good of the order? Hey, Mayor, I need to ask uh, Matt one one quick question. I know we're running a little long here, but Matt, can you give the council an update on the Sterling Inn situation? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, the uh, staff had received um, some dialogue from a potential developer who was looking at um, purchasing the Sterling Inn property and changing it uh, to a multifamily use, which would require a zoning change. Um, the information that we received from the developer really didn't um, change much from an investment standpoint in the property. Uh, be little to no investment um, in the property. It would be merely converting the use from hotel to multifamily. And, uh, and due to the information, at least um, or the research that staff has done, um, results in very, very little change, if not a loss in actually value to the city of that property. Uh, based off of that, we shared with the developer that, um, that there's an interest from the city in seeing true significant reinvestment in that property and not merely just uh, some paint and updating a few rooms on the property. Uh, we shared that with the developer. Uh, I understand that the, the owner, the current owner of the property has been reaching out um, to you folks, indicating that there's a more significant reinvestment happening. What I would offer is staff has not seen that. We haven't seen any new information than what has already uh, already been shared. It, it is not, at least from what we've seen, not a significant reinvestment in the property. So I wanted to just clarify that for the council that um, that we haven't seen anything new from what we've shared before. So that's, uh, Doug, I don't know if you wanna add any anything to that, but that's uh, all I have at this point. Thank you, 
Doug, anything to add there? Uh, no, um, I think Matt's covered it um, at this point. Um, our analysis uh, is complete based on the information that's provided. Um, I know the, the developer and the current owner are both uh, still hopeful that they could put something together. Uh, but at this particular point, um, uh, I've suggested that um, uh, trying to work through the, the university corridor study process, uh, trying to uh, really determine whether or not hospitality within that area is, um, is the long-term right answer. Um, and until we kind of know that, um, making an alternate plan or, or working towards an alternate set of land uses is probably a little premature. Uh, so that's that's been our position at this particular point. So Doug, you haven't received anything new from either the owner or the the developer uh, in the last one to two weeks. Uh, the only thing um, I have had a a simple uh, exchange with the proposed developer. I think it was uh, I think it occurred kind of after potentially some conversations between. The current owner and a few of the council members uh, yeah. just to provide some some clarity on a few questions um, and um, uh, again no no really substantial okay. new information to uh, change the calculus at this point okay nothing notable okay because yeah I mean the way it was expressed to me was they would be providing uh, more detail um, that would would illustrate additional investment that that real investment into the property and then that would be shared with us um, and that so that's kind of the way it was expressed to me um, so if, if that's not happened then that's fine uh, I just want to make sure I got my back straight well Ted and I would I would add to that that the same thing was expressed to me um, as most recent as today okay. um, the information had already been provided um, and uh, that clearly is, is not the case. So, um, it, stuff that obviously that we'll monitor. And I think that, uh, you know, we had good discussion on this item uh, at our last meeting uh, with the information that we did have. And you know, there seemed to be, uh, in my mind anyway, pretty, pretty solid um, consensus around the fact that we were wide open to a great project coming in if we were gonna, if we were gonna change uh, you know, land uses, um, but that this one, as as proposed, was not anywhere close to to uh, what we had in mind. So yeah, that's uh, right. Anyway. I, I, I'm fully comfortable with that decision. I just wanted, if there was new information, I wanted to see that. But if there's not, then then I'm totally comfortable with that decision. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ted. Anything else, uh, Council, for the good of the order? Uh, Your Honor, just one, since we were talking about development, just one last thing uh, to make the council aware is we did receive communication um, about right before the meeting that the developer that was looking at the, the Deerfield Point Apartment project has pulled their application. So they've, they've decided to, uh, to, not, to not move that project forward for rezoning. Okay, Matt, thank you. Thank you for that update. And I'm sure there'll be more to come there, hopefully, as we learn about reasoning, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, other items? Wanted to, right. welcome, wanted to welcome Mayor Merrifield uh, to our meeting tonight from Carlisle. Indeed, welcome, Mayor. Uh, I think Drew, and hopefully if, if you're on, uh, nice to have you uh, here. I think you, we're looking for a little bit of a collaborative guidance on uh, on uh, aquatic centers and uh, in our future this summer. So again, nice to have you. And uh, um, I, th I see you've unmuted yourself, so you can certainly say hello to the council if you desire. Thank you, Mayor, and and I do appreciate. Uh, being in attendance tonight and hearing your discussions. That was a beautiful public safety building. Just an awesome building. I, I am in awe of that. Well, well, thank you, uh, Mayor. We're, we're, we're proud of it. It's been a lot of hard work, as you can imagine. And um, so glad you could join us. Glad we could share it with you. And 
and uh, let us know how we can be helpful going forward. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Well, seeing nothing further, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn us at 8.29 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Um, appreciate all your time and your efforts. Have a great week.